So I've had a bit more time to get to grips with the new lathe, and on the whole, I'm still very happy with it. At least compared to the old lathe. It's just nice to have a proper power feed and that extra rigidity. Plus it also seems like I have a new safe place to store my wallet. So in effect, this lathe is doing two jobs. Which is pretty good value. Now with all that said, I do have a few issues that need to be dealt with before I can really put this lathe to work. Most of them are minor, but there is one big thing which I have overlooked. And that's the gearbox. What I originally thought was the cast texture of the inside of the casing turned out to be a thick layer of sediment in the oil. And that has probably been eating away at the gearbox as I've been running it. I mean I haven't been running the gearbox all that much, but you still don't want that in the oil. This lathe is definitely solid, but as you'll see, it was not well put together. Now this lathe has two gearboxes, which are both going to need draining and flushing. I'll undo the drain plug and let the oil slowly drain out. Mostly because I had no idea how much oil was in the gearbox, but as it turned out, it really wasn't all that much. However, the colour of that oil is pretty worrying. It's just full of dust and sand and who knows what, and it's pretty much black. And it looks like there's a few chunks of cast iron or sand. Good thing I haven't run the lathe all that much, or it could definitely do a lot of damage. And the other gearbox somehow managed to be even worse. That oil has almost no use, but it's black from the amount of dust and grit and whatever else is in it. That's definitely really disappointing, but I guess not really all that unexpected. Thankfully the gears do look fine, at least visually, but sometime in the future I will do a full teardown and make sure that they're all perfectly fine. Now the gearboxes are going to need a proper flush before I put any oil back in. I'm sure there's a ton of grit still in there and that all needs to come out. Now to do the main flush, I'll just use kerosene that's been loaded into a spray bottle. I'll simply spray the gearbox and housing and that should remove any grit that might be stuck on them. And that seemed to do a pretty good job. Now after the first bit of cleaning, I'll put back in the plug and then I'll run it for a few minutes in a bath of kerosene and that should help remove any more grit and dissolve the old oil. And after that, a whole lot more came out. In total, I did this about three times until the kerosene that was coming out was clear. As a final step, I gave it all a clean with white spirits. The white spirits should clean out the kerosene, and it should evaporate a lot more quickly than the kerosene would. And after all that, the gearboxes were both topped up with ISO 68 oil. The manual was quite vague on what oil to use, but several lathes that use a very similar gearbox to this one specifies to use ISO 68. Now considering how poorly they put together the headstock, I'll quickly tear apart the apron, just to make sure it's not going to tear itself apart. That's definitely going to need a deburr. It definitely felt a bit crunchy as I was adjusting the compound. The bottom surface is also a little bit rough. So I'll clean it up with a stone which I've lapped flat. And that feels a lot better than it did before.
Now it looks like they've done a bit of flaking on the bottom of the cross slide. Kind of looks like scraping and in fairness they do use the same tool. But what they've done here is they've scraped channels or grooves into the cast iron. And it's mostly for looks and oil retention. In proper scraping you'd blew it up on a surface plate and make sure everything was level. But that is quite time consuming and I doubt you'd see it here. And as it turns out, that's how the power cross feed works. There's a little pinion on the lead screw, and if you can see it, there's a gear in the carriage that's always spinning. And the gear is able to move forwards and backwards in order to engage the pinion. And that's the apron once I've got it off the lathe. There's that worm wheel that I was wondering about last week. Turns out it's actually driven off a worm, not the lead screw directly. The worm is keyed to the lead screw, you can see the key, and that spins and moves with the lead screw. It then spins that worm gear, which then spins the gears in the gearbox. And just visually, everything seems to be fine. It just needs a little bit of oil. And that's the apron and carriage back in one piece. And thankfully this time, no bolts left over at the end, which I consider a win. Now at this point, with the lathe all cleaned up and oiled, we can now think about doing a few improvements. Now unlike the mini lathe, this one here really doesn't need all that many improvements. But there are a few things that I want to try out, just a few things that will make my time using it a little bit easier. The first one is pretty straightforward, and that's to add a new handle to the tail stock. The stock handle is a little bit small and somewhat awkward to use given its location, and whilst it's not the biggest deal breaker in the world, it could be better. Now the handle seems to be made from some type of medium carbon steel, which I'd also like to use when replacing it. This is mostly down to the fact that I've previously made handles from low carbon steel and I've had them snap at the threads. Unfortunately though, any high tensile steel that I have on hand at the moment is pre-hardened and that would require a heat treatment in order to soften it. I do have some 1045 on hand but it is a little bit short for what I need. So it looks like I'll have to use some mild steel and see what I can do. The tap end will receive threads from a bolt and the steel that it uses will be stronger and should be able to take a lot more force before it breaks. I'll then heat up the rod with some propane and then give it a bend. And the final thing left to do is make up a ball to go on the handle.
and off camera I gave it a coat of black paint. And that's the new handle. Overall it looks really nice. It has a lot more leverage and it's a lot easier to grab onto than the old handle. Now the reason for the bend was to give me a bit of extra room so I could get my hand in to operate the lock on the tailstock. It's a bit more ergonomic and it will just make my time using this lathe a little bit easier and a nicer experience overall. Now the next thing I'm going to do is something that I'm not really sure is an accepted thing to do but it's something that I've done in the past and it's something that has seemed to work and that's to add some type of sealant between the chip tray and the mounting stand of the lathe. Now I want to do this because when I start to use coolant, the last thing I want is for coolant to get trapped under here and sit there for however many months or years. So what I'll do is I'll add a thin bead of silicon around the stand and that should seal it off. I did do this a long time ago on the mini lathe when I used to wet sand a lot and it worked fine then and it should work here. And obviously because the lathe bolts to the stand, I can still get in to shim it in order to take any twist out of the bed. Like I said, no clue if anyone else does this, but it definitely works for me. The next thing I want to do is going to be a bit of an experiment, and that's going to add a chip tray to the carriage in order to keep most of the chips off the bed. I know the carriage has way wipers in order to prevent any chips or dust being sucked under the carriage, but the more stuff we keep off the ways, the better it's going to be. Of course, I could install a way cover like I did on the mini lathe, but what I found was using the way covers, the chips do tend to pile up in the channels and they do need frequent cleaning. I've drawn up a paper template and I'll transfer that to some 1.6mm sheet metal. I'll then bend the metal along the score lines, however I think I accidentally added the score lines to the wrong side. The chip tray then bolts to the carriage and I'll use the same two holes that are used to bolt on the follow rest. Now the chip tray is big enough to be useful but it's not too long as to restrict me from getting close to the chuck. And whilst I have the sheet metal and the paper templates, I'll also make a cover to fit the motor. And to make my life a little bit easier, I'll use the old cover as a template. If you remember back in the last video, I removed it and the backsplash just to make it easier to light the chuck for filming. And after a coat of paint, I can now bolt it to the back. Now the colours don't exactly match, but once it gets a bit of dust and oil and grease on it, you probably won't notice the difference.
Alright, that seemed to do a pretty good job. Tons of chips on the chip tray and almost none on the ways, so I think that is a big improvement. I'll definitely give it a trial run for a few weeks and then decide whether to keep this or go back to using a proper way cover. And with all that done, that is pretty much the upgrades that I was planning on doing, at least for the moment. I'll definitely replace the tool post sometime soon because I'm really not liking the 4-way tool post, but we can do that in another video. I'll also hold off on adding a DRO for the moment, just because I don't think they're exactly all that necessary on a lathe, but I am planning on doing that sometime in the future. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video, thank you very much for watching, see you next week.